On today's episode, we are breaking down the tight end rankings. There's also a whole bunch of news that we got to cover, but we talk a lot of strategy, investing those high round picks on the tight ends. Should you build your team that way, or should you try and find that late round sleeper, that true breakout at that position? So make sure you stay tuned for that. And by the way, my guys are coming up tomorrow. Leave us a comment on your favorite tight end from this year's draft. Subscribe, like the video, enjoy. I have long watched the people of Earth, and I have witnessed their capacity for greatness. They know that in any draft, there are calms between storms. There are days when their league mates turn against them, but the day will never come when they forsake their fantasy draft and the quest for ultimate glory. Rankings, sleepers, breakouts, values. Together at last, united within the Ultimate Draft Kit. The Ultimate Draft Kit stands ready, waiting, watching, protecting, and making your opponents look like stupid, dumb, dumb idiots compared to you and your magnificently hot roster. Will you use it to build your team and win a championship? I do not know, but yes, you probably should. The time for courage and world domination is now at ultimatedraftkit.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Welcome in, one and all. Wednesday, August 17th. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Mike, the Fantasy Hitman, right? Jason Moore, Andy Holloway here. Chilo. <laughs> oh, off to a good start. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> so much to talk about on today's episode of the show. I want to thank the Foot Clan for making us the number one sports podcast in the world right now. Mm, that's, that's pretty cool. That's the the, the power of fantasy football. Uh, we are always, you know, when we're talking to people about what we do, we always say the reality, which is, you could be doing, you could be people from completely different walks of life, doing completely different jobs, different backgrounds, different whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you notice one person in the elevator mentioned something about like your fourth round value at quarterback, you have common ground. Oh, yeah. You know, they're one, they're one of us. You're one of them. It's basically Fight Club. That's, <laughs> that's what it is. Sure. You see a couple bruises and you go, okay, yeah, we're I in together. I know what together. you're about. <laughs> yeah, we're in this together. Even I. Well, my ears will perk up. Like I avoid small talk. Like it is. Ooh, but you're tempted. It's the bubonic plague. But if people start talking fantasy, I'm like, huh? uh, you wanna... I mean, step one is I judge them harshly. As well, they a, probably said something stupid. As a professional yeah. in in the industry, but then I let them continue talking and and don't join the conversation. <laughs> right, right. But you get close. Yeah, which yeah. is the best well, you can do. I consider it. The temptation is real. <laughs> All right, uh, what else is going on? We have the very special Ultimate Draft Kit for Life giveaway. We will be dishing out a, a UDK for life on Friday during a very special live stream, which you can catch uh, by going to ballerslive.com. We'll be on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook. The way you enter, you pick up the 2022 UDK at ultimatedraftkit.com. You want to be Optimus primed for this draft? Ooh. Uh, oh, I see what you uh, did yeah. there. Thank you. Um, Thank you, computer. Uh, yeah, look, this is this is the time. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of you, you're going to get this draft kit the day of your draft. You're going to be like, oh, let's go. That's great. It'll work. But if you get it right now, not only are you entered into the ultimate draft kit for life giveaway, but you get a little bit more time for the extra research, the video profiles, all the information in the toilet time that is outrageously great. Yeah, there's more than meets the eye inside the UDK. Uh, we've... <laughs> You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. I encourage you to follow the main account there and be updated with all the articles. We have a great team of writers 
putting out content each and every week to help your uh, to help your team throughout the season. You can follow Jason at Jason FFL, Mike at FF, at FF Hitman. I'm at Andy Holloway. The quick question of the day. I mean, we're talking about a number of things on today's show, but tight ends, where our rankings are. You know, this is a position where if you hit, it makes a huge difference. Like It does. I don't know if I like any feeling more in fantasy than when I have a superior advantage at the tight end position going into the week because it just kind of gives you buffer – for the variance that by that's natural, right? Like wide receivers, Jason talks about it all the time. They're all kind of inconsistent. You you might have a great big name on your roster, but Jefferson might not get in the end zone, and he might go six for sixty this week, and you don't get the power. But if you have that tight end, mm -hmm. that difference maker at tight end, it just absorbs a lot of that variance. And over the last you know seven eight years, there's been plenty of times. You know we we. Uh, you have to draft Mark Andrews in the second round right now. But there was a, a time when he was the late round tight end mm -hmm. before his breakout. We had that Zach Ertz. Um, I remember when we were hot and bothered before the breakout. That's the goal to me is trying to find the player who will be drafted high next year who's not this year. And if you grab that guy, if we can nail that person down, then your fantasy football year will be awesome. Yeah, and so the quick question is, since we're not talking about this player on today's show, how do you feel about tight end one Taysom Hill? This question comes in from Joel and Gilbert. Currently he's listed as a tight end, uh, which makes Joel believe the coaching staff will utilize him in a way, uh, the same way Peyton did. Do you see him as a value because of his quarterback tight end hybrid capabilities? I just saw some comments from Taysom Hill basically saying, ah, it's not what I wanted, but it's best for the team. Yeah, he is going to be used as the old Taysom Hill. He's not a quarterback. He, he wants to be a quarterback. That's not what is happening. Um, the The coaching staff has come out a, a month or two ago. They talked about using him in kind of that gadget role again. And he's obviously a talented player, but he's a gadget guy. I know we, Mike and myself, have kind of a, a – Really stupid and silly water bet between Taysom Hill and Adam Troutman, which I already regret because I do think <laughs> I do think Adam Troutman okay. will be further involved. Did in you this say offense. Chris Herndon? <laughs> and then, ah, ah, ah. Yeah. No, um, uh, I I think Adam Troutman will be further involved than Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill's real upside here comes if for some reason, which can happen in the wild world of the. National Football League, he gets back in at quarterback and gets to be put in your tight end slot, and we can have that drama all over again. He's listed as a tight end, but the head coach has come out and said he's positionless. So there's not a lot that you ah uh, yes, there's not a lot that you can bank on there. Basically, he they said they're going to give him snaps to impact the game. That's been the comments about Taysom Hill. So that could be they said wide receiver, special teams, tight end, just snaps to impact the game. And if that look. That can be defined any way you want. <laughs> the head coach can put him in for six snaps a game and say that he impacts the game on those snaps. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody's drafting Taysom Hill. If you have a depth chart issue in New Orleans at tight end and he becomes more prominent snap-wise, then, then you're paying attention. All right, let's talk more news. News and notes from around the league. Zach Wilson successfully underwent knee surgery on Tuesday. All right. Was deemed a success. They trimmed uh, his meniscus. So the timeline, um, they are saying, is still open for him to get back by week one. That seems unrealistic, but it is not a season ender. This is something that will keep him out for several weeks from now, and then he will be back and he will be the starter. That is the good news for Zach Wilson. The bad news for Zach Wilson is that his buddy Garrett Wilson <laughs> dunked on him today. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, he tweeted out. Oh, this is um, – do you, well, have, just, do you was, have the quote? He was talking to a reporter, uh, and he said uh, – "There's speaking on the difference between Flacco and Wilson, he said there's definitely a difference. Joe Flacco throws a more receiver-friendly <laughs> ball. Uh, that's just the way to describe it. And – the way that I That's the way the receiver described it. Yeah, that, okay. the way I interpret that is him saying Joe Flacco 
more accurate, more accurate, better quarterback. Maybe he means something different. Probably doesn't throw as hard. I've never played in the the NFL. Well, maybe I, at this stage well, at, in at his this career, stage, sure. Yeah, for I mean, sure. like Prime Flacco had a cannon. Uh, but it, so I've never played uh, wide receiver in the NFL. I'm not sure if people fully realize that fact. So I can't. I've never been in the shoes that of that. You Wilson. haven't been a wideout. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Look. If, yeah. At the at the at the NFL level, people right. make, let the illusion fall away. Now people make the mistake frequently, right? Frequently, yeah. Uh, so I I can't say for sure if that's what he means, but that's what I hear, and that's what everybody else hears. It's the, like when he when he throws me the ball, it's uh, I catch it on the run. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest problem is now, regardless of who's good and who's not, you will have a transition most likely that takes place oh, during sure. your fantasy yes. season. So. If Flacco plays two weeks and then you get hot and bothered by the performance of blank, right? Maybe Garrett Wilson breaks out or Corey Davis is involved again or Elijah Moore looks great. Or even Brees Hall catches like five passes. Mm. And then you're going to go through a transition yeah. to Zach Wilson and we'll be sitting here at the same desk saying, you know, biting our fingernails, going, You're not healthy yet. Get healthier, Zach Wilson. Stay and recover that knee. That's what we'll be saying. Yeah, you will for sure. Uh, the athletic reporting Joshua Kelly appears to be firmly in the lead as the backup for Austin Eckler. Joshua Kelly was a rookie last year for the Chargers. Uh, this year they spent a draft pick on Isaiah Spiller, and Josh Kelly has clearly performed better. R rookie two years ago. Sorry, two years ago. And um, you, you're in a situation now where, I mean, to me this just means the – you're fighting for backup scraps, right? I mean, that's the headline. Well, the the reality is the backup job here for the Chargers should be a decent one. They should be involved. They don't want to have Eckler be someone that's touching the ball 300 times. They just haven't had any talent there. And so the fantasy football community has hoped that Isaiah Spiller is the answer to that problem because he should clearly be better than these other backups. The problem is right now he hasn't been. He is being drafted in underdog leagues like he is the for sure home run walk away backup who has locked into that role. So hearing that, you know, uh, the athletics Daniel Popper is saying that Joshua Kelly is firmly in the lead is a scary thing for people who have a lot of shares of Isaiah Spiller. We had Austin Eckler on the show a couple yes. weeks ago. We asked him about Isaiah Spiller. I didn't, you know, I didn't expect any, you know, groundbreaking information. He didn't speak negatively about Spiller, but I expected some fluff, you know, for his teammate. Like, oh, I've seen some. He, he just kind of was like, well, rookie's got a lot to learn. Just yeah. in general. And and, and it, then it, unprompted brought up Joshua Kelly's name. Right. Of like he he wants to, Eckler feeling like he is the backup. So a combination of Eckler saying those things and these reports, that's that's really sketchy if you're gonna stash Isaiah Spiller. Yeah, I think I think we know what Josh Kelly is athletically at this point, and I think we'd all agree that Isaiah Spiller has more potential for a a big play. But that might come late season. That might come not at all this season at all uh, or, you know, no opportunities. Drew Locke tested positive for COVID-19 right after it was announced that he would be the starter on Thursday's game. Yeah, whoops. Um, he was finally getting first team reps ahead of Geno Smith in practice. This was going to be his opportunity, but he's going to miss the game due to COVID. He'll probably get another chance in the third preseason game. This hey, is big news maybe. right here. I mean, th preseason game three. If I had Geno Smith, I would be giving everybody a chance to, to see what I got. Geno Smith has been a career backup. Sure. Uh, Ken Walker dealing with a hernia issue. Oh, come on, man. The opener is what we're shooting for, says Pete Carroll. So all of a sudden, this ping pong between Rashad Penny injuries now has a, a new entry, Ken Walker, hernia. I mean, we don't know if this is traditional, a sports hernia surgery that – or, you know, that might be required. Does this remove Ken Walker from your board in redraft? Uh, not a not a full removal here. I'm going to wait and see if we can get some more information. It's just it's that whole – the Seattle running back, it, whoever it is, like their value came through the, the proposition that they would see really solid value or, or, or volume because Pete Carroll likes to establish it. But if one guy's got the groin problem, the other guy's got a hernia problem, um, 
I can't recall. I think it was was it uh, Homer Travis Homer Travis was, Homer DJ Dallas. Like they're picking up the receiving role, uh, it, despite what they you know Pete Carroll talking about Ken Walker's receiving ability. It looks like Homer or and Homer company, looked great. He looked great it, too. That's what I'm saying. Like they're probably in that that role. This is it, it, unless we can get one healthy guy to firmly take over and be the guy. These feel like roster clogs at yeah, this point if you have a bunch of split reps unhealthy guys on a bad offense exactly. who aren't in a position to run the clock out it's not good for fantasy there is the other spin though that you know obviously this is saying we're hoping to have him ready for week one from the most optimistic coach in the league yes um there's you know by simple deductive reasoning you could say well there's a chance he's not available week one and if penny is over his hamstring issue and he comes out week one he has an opportunity to be the full-time starter with no ken walker there all we have seen in rashad penny's career when he gets the opportunity for a full workload he has dominated for fantasy so he's a little bit interesting we'll be monitoring the groin as uh, from ah. a distance ah. You want to monitor them from a distance. Uh, Chiefs wide receiver Juju Smith-Schuster didn't practice Tuesday due to a sore knee. This is bad news. So as as the resident yeah, you, Juju Smith-Schuster truther, that's hard to a say. A star is sore. A star. Oh, oh, I like it. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Um, he had his knee drained frequently for the Steelers like on Fridays, and so he hasn't had like an ACL tear – uh, the, but this could be an arthritic knee. I mean, we're, there's a lot like we're reading into this, right? Right sure. now it's just his knee is sore, having some rest, so hopefully could be nothing. But for a player who early in his career looks to have lost a physical step, like not quite as explosive because he's still a young guy. Um, Became much more of a possession type of player after his breakout rookie year. Exactly, and you hoped that that was because of – Big Ben's noodle arm and the role that he needed to play. And it started to look that way this offseason. But if it is due to any kind of degenerative or arthritic knee, then it's not going to just magically get better as he keeps playing football. Uh, I expect they'll have to continue to give him rest and possibly shots. And, you know, it, it just, to me, when I'm it looking at it, it made you nervous. It made me nervous. I upped his risk rating in the draft. I didn't really move his stats that much, but there are a few guys right in the same spot with him that I was taking Juju over, and now I'm like, well, eh, you know, I'd I'd rather take a shot on a on a youthful guy, you know, Rashad Bateman, to break out um, and and take the age. Yeah, my question for this news becomes: Is this why he couldn't get a contract? Like in the NFL, when when a player, a young wide receiver, it like breaks out incredibly young, has two monster seasons, and then just falls off a little bit. The NFL usually bets on that player again, and the guy multiple years in a row could not get a long-term contract. So I'm curious if that... Behind the scenes. If this, if this is NFL information that we don't have in the public, but all the teams know about it. Uh, and just a, a little bit of a follow-up. We don't have complete information on it, but speaking of the Kansas City Chiefs, McCall Hardman... Uh, went up for a ball, landed awkwardly, went to the tent, and then was carted off. Now, I don't know if we have a Buccaneers carted off situation where it's just a cramp, uh, but this is a situation to monitor that McCall Hardman himself, not someone you're clamoring to get on your fantasy football team, but if if for some reason he misses time, it just it it makes you know MVS and even an injured Juju just that much more attractive. I would also throw Sky Moore in there because I think sure I yeah, think yeah, that yeah that's yeah, the yes, real yes absolutely the benefactor from this specific injury. I would expect Juju and MVS to be on the field in two wide receiver sets and and be on the field in three wide receiver sets while Hardman and maybe Sky Moore rotate through the other roles. If uh, if Hardman is gone, then Sky Moore becomes more solidified. And, and Juju did not practice today either. The Chiefs run three wide about 65% of the time, so there is a role and a player that will be out there. Uh, McCole Hardman almost represented a player you never draft but would get in the way of other options. Yes. So, yep. uh, quick break, back with tight ends. All right, we have been walking through – our consensus rankings at wide receiver, running back, uh, just took care of the quarterback shows. 
which leaves one position left, Mike. Are we, do we have to? It's time. Tight ends. I do act. I like talking about the tight end because what Jace, what we were talking about at the top of the show of like the proposition of you gotta spend up. You know, you can get difference makers like Mark Andrews and Travis Kelsey. It's it's an interesting way to construct your team, and when they really come through, it's a it's a difference maker on a week to week basis. But when you don't, and then you at the end of the draft, I love if you've listened to the show. I love trying to find the diamond in the rough. And it's very difficult because sometimes the rough just doesn't have a diamond that particular year. He's been searching and searching. There's nothing in there. But it's it, it trying to find those guys for me is very fun. Well, since 2015, 71% of tight ends drafted in the first five rounds met or exceeded their points per game expectations. So the headline number one is that when you draft them there, they generally meet their expectation. However... When you draft a tight end early, there's an opportunity cost, right? You have the choice of taking a Mark Andrews, a Travis Kelsey, a Darren Waller, a Kyle Pitts, or an early running back or wide receiver that you may like more or may fill your roster out um, better because you're starting two wide receivers. You're starting two running backs on a given week. So there is downside, right? If you spin that pick and you're wrong, right? You aren't in that 71%. Oh, you're crushed. You kind of, yeah, you kind of, you know, give yourself a real uphill climb to contend. The uh, the data last year on Travis Kelsey, Travis Kelsey was great last year. He was, he was awesome. Yeah. He was a late first round pick and he was great. Uh, for best ball leagues, if you want to look at advance rates, that's one of the easiest ways to just take an individual player and say, did they help fantasy rosters or hurt fantasy rosters when they were drafted over a massive scale of data? He was a bad pick. He was just straight up a bad pick, and he was good. The reason isn't because he was bad. The reason is because you're sacrificing a first-round running back or wide receiver. So you could win with Kelsey when he's good, but more often than not, you lost because you didn't have that depth at more important positions, and that was when he was good. If one of those early guys goes down or, you know, just is disappointing, really tough to recover. Well, and, and let me tell you one of the ways that I look at those top-tier tight ends. I like to trade for them. Yes. If I'm going to have them on my team, I like to acquire them in the season when I've checked box one, which is that I don't have a complete flame out, right? You see them establish themselves. And I try to trade for them because people are going to run into problems that draft these guys. They may not have a wide receiver or running back. Um, they could get off to a tough start. And that's when I kind of target a difference maker at the position. Because like I said at the top, I love having it. I want that advantage or potential advantage going into the week. There's nothing I, I hate more than going into the week with a, you know, a tight end that I'm begging to catch one pass for seven yards in a touchdown where I know that I can't have a big performance. And that actually influences the way I rank these guys. We'll talk about that. At number one, Mark, Trav Wait, what? <laughs> Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews sits at number one. Can you believe it? Yes, that's where he should be. Last year, uh, you know, he had a dominant season, especially from week 10 on. We all have him at number one, 27 years old. He was essentially... The wide receiver six in scoring ahead of Tyreek Hill. That's how influential uh, his role was. 107 catches, 1,300 yards, nine touchdowns. All you did this offseason was trade away Hollywood Brown. You get a healthy Lamar Jackson back to start the season. Those two have had a mind meld for a long time. And much like Kelsey in years past, like Andrews can't, he really can't bust. Mm hmm. Right, he's uh, not too, on the field. Not on the field, yeah. right? If he if it gets injured, of course. But there's no way for this offense to function without him as the key cog in the middle of it. Yeah, there's a lot uh, that's been pointed out about some of Mark Andrews' biggest, best, most highest targeted games last year coming when Lamar Jackson wasn't on the field, and that that makes sense. Lamar Jackson's going to run a lot, but the offense is worse. When you look at actual fantasy production. Mark Andrews was phenomenal with Lamar Jackson, as he has already been. A couple years ago, he had double-digit touchdowns with Lamar Jackson. The loss of Hollywood Brown 
you know, everyone is like, oh, well, Bateman now steps into that role. We hope. And, and even if he does, this is good for Mark Andrews. It is – he's the number one receiving option for Lamar Jackson on this team. The upside for a player who just had over 1,350 yards at the tight end position, you know he can get it done. He is the primary best receiving option for what should be a decent offense with Lamar Jackson. And unlike Travis Kelsey, who's going ahead of him in the first round, Mark Andrews is falling to the back of the second. That's where... The now, are you taking him there? I, I am willing to take him there at the 2-3 turn. When I'm close enough to the 2-3 turn where I know the third player that I would get if I take him second, uh, you know, I say, oh, I'm three picks away from my next pick, and I've got, you know, it looks like Leonard Fournette will easily fall to me or someone like that, then I know that I can end up with two great, because you, you started with the 101 or the 102, you're going to end up with two great wide receiver or running back, you know, one, one of each or two of one, and a tight end that we all have as the number one tight end. So he's the one early guy, early, that I'm willing to take. Okay. Mike, the, do you have anything to add there with uh, Andrews before we move on? I'll just play the, the devil's advocate here is what the Ravens were as a team last year, which was not typical for what Baltimore is. Like They were number one in plays per game because of the way that they the, – the, the tempo that they were going combined with – remember how bad the defense was for the Baltimore Ravens last year – they had they had to rely on the offense. That's not the way that Harbaugh has generally generally run things. And if you want to just to easily highlight how crazy the 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 passing attempt volume was for just Lamar Jackson in 2020, in 15 games, Lamar threw the ball 376 times. In 2021, he started 12 games, but if you recall that his last game, he played 10 percent of the snaps. So essentially, 11 games. He threw the ball 382 times, so four fewer games, six extra passing attempts. Like this, the, the Ravens were crazy last year compared to where they were historically. So that's that's the concern with with Mark Andrews is that he was his numbers were really juiced uh, last year because of the passing volume that the team has told us that they don't want to be that now. Will they have to do it again? That that's TBD, and that's up to you as the drafter to what are your projections for the team. But that's that's my only red flag for him. But the the player is great. Travis Kelsey comes in at number two in our rankings, being drafted as the tight end one right now at the top of the second round. And um, you know we know his role in the offense. He led all tight ends in third down receptions. He's a go to receiver, ninety two for eleven hundred and nine. I don't need to give you the resume of Travis Kelsey, so let's spend our time with Travis Kelsey just talking about draft cost, um, whether he'll return value this year, and and whether he's just kind of off your board. Uh, he's going to re he's going to be good this year. Obviously, he is first ballot Hall of Famer, the tight end one 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 two last year. So he's great, and so he's now falling off. Got he it. becomes the <laughs> he, now he becomes the primary target with Tyreek Hill gone. There, there is no doubt he, uh, barring injury, will be very good for fantasy this year. I do think that he does not get better with the absence of Tyreek Hill and another year on the old life meter. I think that <laughs> Travis Kelsey... As they say. Almost 33. Yeah, he will be playing football this year at age 33. And even the greats of the greats, Tony Gonzalez, who played very well even later into his career, you saw just such a massive drop-off from that age 32 to age 33 season. Now if you are the primary focal point and you're not having to worry uh, defensive scheming about Tyreek Hill and you're like, okay, we've got to lock down Travis Kelsey. He's 33 years old. He's going to get his. You can't stop Zeus. But you can stop him from having a otherworldly breakout year for him. He's not going to have his career best numbers at 33. It's just not going to happen. So he will be great. I think the draft cost is too much. I love your idea, Andy, of just trading for him. If he has a down week or two, uh, you know, if, if... Oh, you can sell that narrative. Old, no Tyreek. If you want to acquire him at that point, it'll be easy sell. If he has a bad week one, oh, I'll go after him because it won't cost you anything near what a first round draft pick is. And and I, I see on Sleeper ADP he's dropped to the top of the second, but most of the drafts I've been in, I see him at the end of the first. This is where things get a little more interesting. Dalton Schultz at number three. Um, 
He's the tight end six by ADP. He finishes the tight end three last year. This is just how it ended up with the way the three of us ranked him and when the averages um, came together. I will not have any Dalton Schultz. Uh, not because I don't think he will be solid, but because of the way I approach the tight end position. Like, I, if I'm going to spend a, a draft pick in the middle rounds on a tight end, I want a player that has the ability to and the athleticism to give me, you know, the Kyle Pitts seven for one sixty three, nine for one nineteen. Um, Dalton Schultz is not a, an athletic specimen. He's not bad. He's just not he's, anywhere yeah, like middle tier. He's not Waller, Kittle, Pitts yeah, that is level athleticism. So all I'm saying is, I think you will get such a solid week to week performance from Dalton Schultz. They're going to need him, but. Um, the way I look at the tight end position, I don't think I'm going to jump. I mean, it's a six-round pick, so maybe I get more tempted when I'm in the thick of it. it, that's, it that's the problem is <laughs> I love Dalton Schultz. His opportunity is incredible. Uh, he's he's the number two passing option on this team for the foreseeable future until Michael Gallup recovers from that ACL injury and proves that he should be the number two target. <laughs> Dak, we just featured Dak of like he's – Prescott's one of those guys that he just figures it out, and he runs a really strong offense. So all of those things point to me as saying, I want Dalton Schultz on my team. Yeah, I don't have to pay a top-tier price for him. But these tight ends, I know we we said you know the, the tight ends in the first five rounds, they return on their ADP or whatever, but that's not necessarily fantastic. And these guys in the sixth round, historically, have just been such a trap of you get – it's not the worst, so you, you're not having to hit the wire to stream players over him. But you're stuck but you're with him, you're just like, oh, this – I got to play him again. Uh, so it it is a very – I am stuck in a very conflicted place here of opportunity, great offense, versus what I know about these tight ends who go in the middle rounds. Yeah, do you want to take your six-round pick and say, I am signing up for this to be guaranteed – mediocrity because that's that's what you're doing with Schultz it's not bad he's not going to be bad but he's not going to be a world beater it's very similar to Austin Hooper when he was a Falcon had back-to-back -back tight end six seasons he was very good but if you actually look at did he help you win in fantasy football no the tight end six the tight end five at the end of the year they're they're usually pretty worthless uh you know TJ Hawkinson was a top five tight end a couple years ago he's, like, nobody liked that season. Right. And you had bad stretches last year with Schultz. So it's too high a draft. Here's the four players going behind Dalton Schultz when you're on the clock. Brandon Cooks, A.J. Dillon, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, and Jalen Hurts. Those are those are potential difference makers for a roster. Um, I, I think Dalton Schultz will stat his way, stat accumulate his way to an end-of-season good ranking, but he's not going to help you win. He's not winning games for you in fantasy football. Yeah, and, you know, last year you had some injuries that that put him at three, right? George Kittle was better points per game. Rob Gronkowski was better points per game. Dawson Knox was very close. And Waller was beat up all year. Yeah, so so you just need to – I didn't realize we'd have that shared of an opinion of the Dalton Schultz situation, but um, because he's a, what, 73rd percentile quickness score, he's not a player that's going to take a middle-of-the-field ball and, you know, break a couple tackles and go down the sideline. He's going to be a – very trustworthy target, but much more later, you know, much more Jason Witten. Yeah, Mike had a great tip of arbitrage, and there are plenty of arbitrage options for Dalton Schultz where you say, okay, Dalton Schultz is not this supreme athlete. He's just got to be so involved in the offense. Well, so is Cole Komet. Yeah. Cole, Cole Komet is just a cheaper version of Dalton Schultz where you can add A.J. Dillon to your roster. You're not adding A.J. Dillon in the 10th round. Kyle Pitts comes in at number four. 110 targets last year, one touchdown. Finishes the tight end seven as a rookie. Difficult to go out there and make a difference as a rookie. <laughs> Went over the 1,000-yard mark. But, um, you know, this season, it's going to be very, very interesting for Kyle Pitts because we were talking about in the office the other day, Jason. He's just a wide receiver. Oh, man. <laughs> he's, he's, Kyle Pitts is, is is hurting my soul, man. I almost made him a my guy. I almost went all the way in. What? Yeah, he was. He was by the way, the my guy episode tomorrow. Oh baby, uh, he, he was on my Kyle, short is list. Kyle Pitts on the 
Um, Show well, tomorrow. I mean, uh, TBD. We'll see. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I go back. But the cost is a ton. The cost is a third rounder, and you know, we just talked about the players you can get behind Dalton Schultz. Obviously, the difference between Dalton Schultz and Kyle Pitts is Kyle Pitts could finish as the tight end one. He has the ability, yes, the yes, physical ability, to just dominate. If he ended up with fourteen hundred yards and six touchdowns. That's that's in his range of outcomes where he is just an every week must start wins you a couple weeks outright uh, physical freak. You watch the tape, oh, man, and you're just you're just blown away by what he can do. That being said, I'm, um, I'm reading this this before you give me the negative. I'm reading this tweet from Scott Barrett, friend of the show, saying who was the best outside wide receiver technically last year in the NFL, and it was Kyle Pitts ahead of Debo Jefferson and Devontae Adams. Interesting. Does he cite what metric he's talking yeah, about? Yeah, yards per route run, routes okay. out wide. Kyle Pitts was the most effective <laughs> outside wide receiver in the game of football above all of those names. And there's nothing in camp that dissuades you from that reality. Yeah. So good. There's it's so good. <laughs> there's nothing that, you know, and the time will come. Like, that's the other storyline, and I'll, I'll get back to you, Jason. But the other storyline with Pitts is, it's win, not if. Yes. With it, Kyle Pitts. So you don't want to be on the wrong side of win. Yeah, I mean, when I stat out the Atlanta Falcons, I have them being a slow-paced team that runs far more than they should, just like they did last year, who now adds, you know, they, they, they lost all their wide receivers last year, and so then Kyle Pitts was it. They added Drake London, and they go from Matt Ryan, a very good quarterback, to Marcus Mariota, a – you know, a, a mostly wash a backup. flame out backup. And so to have enough passing volume, you're going to have 1,500 fewer passing yards as a team this year than they did last year going from Matt Ryan to Marcus Mariota. You're going to have fewer passing touchdowns. When you then divvy up a much smaller pie, the stats don't look great for me for Kyle Pitts. I don't have a problem if you want to call your shot. If you want to take a swing for the fences in the third and say, I believe he's a 1,500-yard, six-touchdown machine this year, you can do it. I can't do it. Now, I don't know if it matters, but when Marcus Mariota had Delaney Walker, it was mm -hmm. pretty, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, he had a, a season with 133 targets, Delaney 94 Walker 94 for 1088 and six. And that's Delaney Walker. Oh, yeah. my God, shut so, up. That was an aged Delaney Walker. Who was Walker was a great athlete in his time. The The biggest difference between that and what we're talking about is uh, at that time, you would draft Delaney Walker in the, from the waiver wire. <laughs> like, he, you weren't paying a third-round pick saying this. If he slides to the fourth, this, are you in? Uh, probably. The, I'm, I'm with Jason that my stats don't have him there. But I fully recognize he you can play fit. to win. You play, you the play game. to win, and Kyle Pitts is a league-winning type of a player. That in the third round, if it's like I have, I have some best ball drafts where I've I've taken Kyle Pitts, like because you want I I want some exposure to this. I don't want. I I think that's the best way. Yeah, for me no, to that put is it, a good is way to put it. I want in on Kyle Pitts, but I'm not I'm not pushing all the chips in. Because with Marcus Mariota and it will be it will be very surprising to me if at some point the Atlanta Falcons don't put Desmond Ritter in and right. just to see what they have because the, the, this is not a team that projects to win. The only way Marcus Mariota keeps his job the full season is if they're in playoff contention. That would be a pretty shocking thing. Crazy stuff happens in the NFL, so I'm not saying that's impossible, but uh, that put the probability of that very low. So you're going to have a quarterback change. You have what Jason laid out of just an overall production drop because of the way that these quarterbacks play. So it's it's very scary. But the upside is the tight end one. <laughs> this is funny. So you asked, would you would you draft him if he falls? You know, to the to the back of the third. So I pulled up one of my drafts to the just fourth. Yeah. To, to the fourth. I pulled up one of my random drafts just to have a draft board that was live and I wanted to see where that break was for me and I got through the third round and I thought okay I would take all those players over Pitts and then I looked at the next player and I was like that's where I would take Pitts at at, at this top of the top, fourth top of the fourth and then I looked and that is where I took Pitts in this draft. Oh, that was me that took him there go. 401 so that so is you followed your own advice yeah incredible Darren Waller at five George Kittle at six 
two names with a lot of history in fantasy football. Big performances, big years. Uh, we know what the potential is. The question is, are we going to get it? And the draft costs right now, they're both uh, mid to late fourth round picks. Waller and Kittle. It's tough. Uh, we want to know what the impact is of Devontae Adams on the target share for Darren Waller. We know he's a freak. I mean, he's great. But last year was an injury play campaign. And then Kittle's, that's been his narrative too. He, he has the potential to be the focus of an offense on any given week. But Trey Lance. Kittle to me, if I, these guys are going around the same uh, spot and one of them I'm willing to take and one of them I'm not. The only middle uh, round tight end that I'm willing to take is George Kittle. And the reason is because when he booms, he goes nuclear. Bada boom. He bada booms. He big bada booms. And uh, <laughs> he has just the ability to, like you said, uh, he's the anti-Dalton Schultz. He can catch the ball in the middle of the field, break four tackles, carry somehow 12 men on his back, mm -hmm. his own quarterback added to the pile, <laughs> yes. and, and walk it into the end zone. You now have a stronger arm in Trey Lance. It's a, it's a question mark. It's a worry. You could say, look, this could be really bad for Trey Lance. It could be good, too. We don't yes, know. And sometimes those uh, unknown situations is where fantasy glory arises from. He's also the younger player um, in George Kittle over Darren Waller. And he did not add Devontae Adams to his team to soak up target share. So I'm, for me, my tight end strategy this year is if Mark Andrews gets to the back of the second, now I will add Kittle in the fourth or George Kittle in the fifth. Those are that's it. At end of my list. The all the guys we're about to talk about from here till we get to the fun ones at the end of the draft. I'm going super late round or those three guys at value. Darren Waller might give a quick uh, summation of your thoughts on the Walrus. Oh, uh, it's Devonte Adams is very scary for for Darren Waller. The the when we saw him be elite, you know, the breakout campaign was a twenty four percent target share that skyrocketed to twenty eight, and then in games played last year, it was it was down at twenty three percent. Now I know he was you know it was a weird year for him. Uh, cause, cause he was banged up, but even in the games where he was playing, we all, aside from, you know, week one, when it was holy freaking crap, 19 targets for Darren Waller, he's going to do it again. And then it was just kind of, mm, eh. even with those targets, it just, it wasn't turning into production. Only so. four double digit games in 11 played. Yeah. He, it, it was, it was very Last year's uh, production was very scary, considering you know the, the age of the breakout for Darren Waller. Can he really keep it going? Has the NFL figured something out here of of how we can how they can possibly stop him after multiple years of film? So he's, I would Jason that he's a very scary player, and I even though even with the projections of I have him you know high, I think I would prefer the draft cost and going in on uh, George Kittle. Seven is TJ Hawkinson. Eight is Zach Ertz. Nine, Dallas Goddard. Ten, Cole Komet. So, did you guys uh, catch Hard Knocks last night? I haven't watched it oh, yet. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, I heard it was uh, Swift centric. Yeah, it it was. It was interesting, which the, I'm excited about. The stuff on Swift was very interesting, but the and I I know these are very anecdotal things, but. Amon Ross St. Brown, they were they were talking to him, and you know, incredible rookie year breaks the Lions' records for receptions and yardage, and there's it's a sit down interview, and he's talking about he's like, oh, I know all sixteen wide receivers who were drafted in front of me, I know their names, I know where they went to college, <laughs> and he just start and he just starts rattling them all off, yeah. and you can see in his face like the determination. This man, this man is not like happy about what happened last year. He wants to bury those other wide receivers and he like unironically is like Jamar Chase LSU Jalen Waddle Alabama and he's like the way he's just talking about these guys is he is 1000% sure he is better than they are it was just it's just a murder it was, list it was interesting to see that fire in that sit down at, Steve at, Buscemi from uh, <laughs> yeah it was just, Armageddon it, yeah, I'm, I'm sure other people have a similar takeaway when you see it you're like oh holy crap 
this guy this guy is still furious. Yeah. I don't, I don't which, think you that's Armageddon. not Armageddon. No, <laughs> that's a different Bujini. You went crazy in Armageddon. That's why. Was I, what, what was that? Billy, Billy Madison. Madison. Yeah. yeah, thank With you. With the lipstick list. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so no, I bring that up because of Hawkinson. I have been a TJ Hawkinson supporter in the past. He's he, you know, it Who last, still looks like a lion. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. He yeah. is well cast in the <laughs> D- Detroit team. Um, the the problem is with TJ Hawkinson. It's similar to uh, Dalton Schultz in that he's been a volume guy, except he has less touchdown opportunity. Now you have Amon Ross St. Brown. Now you have DJ Chark, eventually Jamison Williams. TJ Hawkinson isn't going to be Mr. Necessary at tight end. He costs a six-round pick. I'm out. Uh, Zach Ertz, uh, after Hawkinson, opportunity for Ertz is really in the first six weeks when you will not have the Hopkins target share. I am st- I'm just not that excited anymore. He costs you an eight, which is where it starts to be okay. But if he drops in a draft, when when you're an eighth round pick, it's very easy to drop to the tenth. It's it's really when you get these guys after their ADP that you can get value. He should soak up targets in the beginning of the year. Yes, uh, you saw that when Hopkins was gone last year. Obviously, now they add Hollywood Brown. He's again a guy that doesn't have the athleticism anymore to break tackles. You're just going to get what you get. So when it when it comes to tight end it's just a matter of what are you giving up to draft this player Zach Ertz is fine to begin the season but I would rather give up a 10th rounder and Cole Komet is like the standard to me Cole Komet's in the 10th round sure. I would rather grab Cole Komet in the 10th than most all these guys where it 11th. cost me he's in the 11th even better in the 11th <laughs> I'd still take him in the 10th well, well right because a, a 10th <laughs> rounder you know yeah, what's the difference? Yeah, the 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 eighth, ninth, seventh round players there. I would rather grab one of those wide receivers or running backs and grab Cole Komet in the tenth or eleventh than be like, oh, instead of Cole Komet, I really need Zach Ertz or T.J. Hawkinson. Just these guys aren't good enough. A- it- yeah, Andrews, Kelsey, Schultz, Pitts, Waller, Kittle, Hawkinson, Ertz, Goddard, and Komet. Um. What tight end ranked outside the top 10 has the best chance to be a difference maker in your mind? Um, I will I will go with Dawson Knox. That's fair. Uh, I think he, w- you know, you're attached to the best quarterback in football for fantasy purposes. You had a nice season last year, and a lot of the reasons why, you know, we talk about Cole Beasley leaving, right? And one of the reasons why J- Jason likes James Cook and his opportunity out of the backfield, look, there are, there are targets to go around. Like Gabe Davis is probably he, he's not the Cole Beasley role. He's he's going to be a field stretcher, a touchdown guy. There are opportunities. I think Dawson Knox is pretty safe, and then you get those games that will boom. Um, outside of him, what other names do you are you interested in? I, I was interested in Irv Smith, and I think on the season you take a look at him. But right now he's got the uh, broken thumb, and we're hopeful he's back for week one. So I'm not really drafting him in redraft leagues right now. There is an opportunity there for him to be the number three in targets on this team uh, for a better offense. I would throw out Hunter Henry. Hunter Henry is a guy who has been fantasy relevant many seasons in his career. If Mac Jones takes a step forward, He's obviously looked to in the red zone where when you're looking at these later round tight ends, usually their season goes as well as the amount of touchdowns they receive. And Hunter Henry has a knack for that. Uh, So he would be one of those late, late round guys um, that I like. The the two I want to highlight, I'll start here. Hold your grimaces, ladies and gentlemen, but it is Evan Ingram who got a essentially a $10 million one year deal from the Jacksonville Jaguars and Doug Peterson, at least historically, multiple years of Doug Peterson uh, uh, being in the offensive mind of the Philadelphia Eagles, his tight ends see a massive target share. And the like the depth chart, I know that Kirk, uh, Christian Kirk got a, a huge amount of money, but is Zay Jones really an answer? That's to be determined. Marvin Jones, we all love Marvin Jones, but that guy is past his prime. Absolutely. It's like, there is it this is more of a also a PPR thing but I think Evan Ingram could be very very surprising as a 70 plus 80 plus reception player and then I think a guy that we more agree on would be David Njoku from the Cleveland Browns he fits a lot of the check boxes that you want from your late round tight end it's just a athleticism that's off the chart if if we knew that Watson were 
playing the entire year. Watson would be drafted very highly, uh, and like Njoku looks like he could become the number one target for that team. I know they have Cooper, but there's a chance that Njoku is actually the main guy for that team. I, I'm in on that, not the Ingram one. There oh, are know. so many tight ends that are completely undrafted that could break out this year. Could the Muth get Luth again? Oh, the Muth could get Luth. He's going into oh, year two, and <laughs> his talent from year one looks great. So, Pat Fryermuth, you want to take a shot on him leveling up because rookie tight ends aren't yeah. good, and he was good as a rookie. So I got no problem with that. You can you can either shoot your shot on huge upside, which I think I would put Pat Fryermuth in that category. I don't like his uh, – you know, offense around him and the touchdown situation. upside, but he has upside in himself. Gerald Everett has the touchdown upside of uh, Big Herb throwing him the ball. If you want to go more the the safe route, you're like ah, I'm grabbing a late round tight end. Maybe Cole Komet got grabbed in the tenth. Wait for your last pick and take Austin Hooper. Austin Ho Austin Hooper profiles to possibly be the number two target in this offense. At worst, the number three has probably a better quarterback at throwing touchdowns than uh, Justin Fields anyways, you know, it, it, he's undrafted. So you don't need to worry and tilt about, oh, no, what, what tight end am I going to get? Yeah. I do have a groinindex.com update. Oh. Ah! McCall Hardman's injury was a groin injury. Oh, my groin. Also, Jarek McKinnon missed practice with a hamstring injury. Oh. Pacheco. So there you go. Um, <laughs> that's it. That's it for the tight end episode. If we you want to see it. all of the rankings in order, the other names we mentioned, Knox and Fryermuth and Henry, um, you can check that out in the Ultimate Draft Kit. You can check out the regular rankings on the website, thefantasyfootballers.com. News breaking every minute. That's why we do a show every single My day. My guys tomorrow. My guys episode tomorrow. I've been. People are asking, when's it coming? Well, it's tomorrow, so don't miss it. <laughs> Make sure you follow, subscribe to the show to the show and we'll catch you then goodbye thank you for listening to another episode of the fantasy footballers podcast join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on twitter at the ff ballers